Gaming Classic 2022. We have a fantastic panel right now with Mr. Chris Downing. So what's going on, guys? What I just really wanted to talk about today is we I've been up on the uh, up in the bit built room up on the second floor there for all day and we're really displaying and talking about uh, portable console mods and uh, I just kind of want to talk about the history of them where they came from so uh, if it may be a little technical so if anybody's interested in this type of stuff I invite you to come by but anyway so I hope you're all having a good time at MGC 2020 so far and of course I want to thank you all for stepping in for today's little panel on today's little stage. It's pretty cute. Um, so what I got planned to talk about is comparatively a, a small hobby in the grand scheme of things um, when it comes to hobbies. But um, it's brought me and a lot of uh, other friends of mine to several places we'd never dreamed we'd go. Um, and in reality, it started with just a simple curiosity that did indeed lead down a deep, dark rabbit hole. <laughs> So I'd like to open up this panel with a quick introduction. Um, my name is Downing. I want to explain a little bit about what the hobby of uh, portableizing is. I'm a console modder, and if that sounds familiar to anyone, we can be friends on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 7 to 8 p.m. I'm also 39 years old from the backwoods of New Hampshire. Uh, father of two amazing pain in the asses that I love, and husband to the most tolerant wife on the planet. I've been into modding portable scene for 12 years now, and aside from music, it's been the hobby I've been the most passionate about, and without a doubt, it's cost me more money than anything than my kids. Specifically, I'm part of a small community called Portableizers, which has become sort of a genre in the modding community as a whole. What the hell is a portable? Uh, you might ask. Well, it's pretty self-explanatory, but if you can't guess, uh, we take home-based gaming consoles and make them portable. Well, the exact terminology or commonly accepted term in the community is um, a modification that makes a stationary TV and or display-based gaming console portable with its own audio, video, and power supply. So meaning aside from battery charging, it doesn't need to be plugged into anything to run. Now, this uh, is important to know that it doesn't necessarily mean handheld, which uh, many do confuse. So technically, any battery-powered arcade cabinet could still be classified as a portable, uh, but for the most part, portable refers to mostly handheld versions of popular TV-based systems. So what we're going to talk about really is how this whole hobby began, uh, how it struck a nostalgia chord and inspired hundreds of new modders, and uh, its techniques, pitfalls, and how technology has allowed for some of the most sophisticated homemade projects that are damn near commercial quality at this point. So in part two here, we're going to talk a little bit about the early days and the birth of a new concept, uh, the pioneers of the hobby, and the momentum that really started with it. So portableizing as a hobby has been around for over two decades now, believe it or not. There was growing popularity for cell phones in the early 2000s, and that technology began to focus towards making them smaller, lighter, and power supplies that lasted much longer. So as smartphones really became a thing in the late 2000s, focus really began to shift towards smaller, thinner displays and more compact and powerful batteries. As these two components became more available and cheaper, the concept of making TV-based game consoles portable was born. And man, it has shown some very impressive results in the past decade. So in the early 2000s, the pioneer of the whole portable making uh, movement started, with a scene, started the scene with a portable Atari 2600. The man's name, as we all know, is a frequent visitor to this event and an internet legend in the maker fields. And I'm, of course, referring to Ben Heck and the mods that followed over 20 years later have been part of the return of the whole maker movement that's inspired a whole, general, a whole generation to understand how things actually work. So by the time 2010 rolled around, some very amazing builds had already circulated the internet and resources uh, many others started to become available and more and more modders began to document their work, which was largely due to digital and cell phone cameras finally being affordable to everyone. So though Ben had pioneered the hobby in the very early 2000s, it really was a crude process in its infancy and that most of the engineering realm would consider too daunting. And I mean, really, at the time, there just wasn't a practical way to get educated in the hobby if you were starting from scratch. Yes, the internet was becoming commonplace in most homes, and you could find engineering or basic electronic tutorials easy enough, but the content as far as how specifically to build a system just wasn't there. 
it was very still much I had to figure things out on my own, and aside from his blog post about the project, that was pretty much all you had to work with. Um, now in a broader scope at the time, DIY wasn't much of common practice. It was argued that it disappeared for a number of reasons, but mainly caused due to industry shifts in the US economy, and us sending our manufacturing jobs overseas in lieu of becoming a more uh, service-based economy. But, for, but the removal of vocational programs from schools and high focus on needing a college degree to be successful really capped off the decline of skilled and hands-on individuals. The jobs were gone, so the formal and traditional and on-the-job education went with them. But that was about to change in a big way. Because in early 2005, a new website had launched that would essentially give anyone the ability to create and post content in a single place for the entire world to see. And I'm of course talking about YouTube, and when that really began to gain traction, one part of our whole culture started to revive, and that was the DIY do-it-yourself group that had been missing in action for over 20 years. The inspiration for others to create that content really started to build, and that really was what was needed for tech, and all we needed was for technology to catch up and make the resources to create that content available to everyone. And incidentally, this push in cell phone technology was right in line with portable making and creating content easier for YouTube. It was really a perfectly timed combination that was exactly what console portableizing needed to become practical. Because by 2008, all the resources had aligned and um, communities like the Ben Heck forums and Mod Retro had already started to take advantage. These forums were loaded with project showcases, but more importantly, build logs which really started to lay the groundwork and provide resources for others who may have had interest but no real diving board to jump off of. This is exactly where I was back in 2009, and with these resources in place, I was able to start into a hobby that would later lead to some very life-changing experiences. Anyway, I first dipped my toes into this back in 2009 when I was trying to repair an OG N64 control stick that had worn through. Uh, it was a pretty common problem at the time for the N64 first party controllers, and while searching for fixes and finding just a few tutorials through Yahoo, uh, I decided to try out YouTube. Though YouTube had become a game changer at that point for countless industries, tutorials on mods and fixes for the N64 were few and often mixed with people just playing their old N64 they dug out of the closet. Um, however, one video popped up from the search results, and at the time, I was totally blown away to find out it was even a thing. It was like someone took my greatest dream when I was a young teenager and brought it into reality. And that mod that started it for me uh, was the Darth 64 by Modder Hailraiser. Now, you have to picture the situation here because some of the senior modders in the room may appreciate this. Because at that moment, I was sitting at the desk and just spent over two hours attempting to do a joystick repair mod, which consisted of taking the controller apart removing the stick box assembly, taking that apart to get to the stick itself, and get this, wrapping goddamn scotch tape around the base of the stick to try and replace the plastic material that had been worn through. So sitting there and watching this, screwdriver in one hand, scotch tape in the other, and I said, you know what, I'm gonna make one of these. Now before we really dive into the history and examples of the early days of the hobby, I just wanna get a bit of beginner's advice to those who are interested in getting into this. And really, what's going to make this whole thing a great deal easier to do successfully is first understand exactly what you're jumping into and set your expectations of what you want to get out of it. Now, back when I said to myself, I'm going to make one of these, little did I realize how much of a bold claim that was actually going to end up being. With anything new, there's always a million questions, but going in cold, you soon find that for every question answered, at least two or more replace it, and usually with growing complexity. And when I started my first project, I didn't have any kind of learning process in play. At the time, it was just constantly looking at the big picture. So when you're new, oftentimes you want to judge how much you've advanced in the, and by the status your build is currently in. But that leaves the door wide open to a very negative perception of your abilities if your project begins to go south. It took me over six months to finish my first portable build, doing things the hard way for every step of it. And though the build was chaotic, next time around I understood the importance of knowing what you don't know. Or, in other words, being aware of potential roadblocks based on your current skill sets and knowledge of the task at hand. And that became my build process, which I still employ today. Know what you don't know. In context of looking at a project and breaking it down into sections that you can assess what you think you know about it, 
then leads to the specific questions you know you don't know, and in turn focuses you on into uh, possible effects of the situation it can have on the project overall. But it also allows you to make a framework and how to tackle the issue before it becomes a bigger problem down the road. But realistically, even with the process in place, you're still going to have the what did I get myself into or I can't do this, but mostly there'll be WTF moments. And that does lead to some very discouraging thoughts about your abilities. And I'm not going to lie, you could very easily fry a motherboard, burn a hole through your casing with a soldering iron, or even send yourself to the ER with a Dremel wound. Done. But really, even though all these could scrap your project instantly, the fact remains that it doesn't matter if your project failed. You still haven't gone backwards in the knowledge you've gained by working on it. Quite frankly, even after a big failure, you're often left with more insight and possibly stitches to really drive that knowledge home. Uh, it's important not to forget this, because I mean, ER visits suck, they're expensive, and it really is just far easier not to be a dumbass. So being able to focus on the learning aspect from the start is what's going to allow you to succeed, but it's also going to test your patience more than anything else. Between research and troubleshooting is where you're really going to have your forehead neat desk moments. And I get it, research can be boring as hell, especially when you want to dive right into a build, but I assure you it doesn't hold a candle to the pain that endless troubleshooting can cause. And of course, the reality is that the more research you do up front, the less chance you get caught in a troubleshooting cluster F that takes hours to figure out, and where rage quitting is a real possibility. But I think that's why jumping into the hobby today can yield extremely impressive results much earlier on for newcomers. No matter what, there's going to be a learning curve, but I mean honestly now because of the info and resources specific to this hobby are just so abundant and so refined to modern day tools and techniques, that those who even put in a little bit of research are uh, miles ahead of where I was in comparison. Now, of course, before you hit me with the OK Boomer, what was you critique? Understand that I'm very happy to have gotten into the scene for the first, in the time frame I did because it required you to take the highest road there was to even accomplish something that by today's standards would look a little, yeah. Everyone had to be a trailblazer in some way, and even if the end result looked like it was beaten out of the ass end of a trash can, it still gained respect from the community. But more importantly, it became another resource for others to build off of. So what we're going to do next is talk, is uh, take a look at some of the early trailblazers and their projects and look specifically into the techniques they used at the time to pull them off. Now this list was comprised of projects specifically between the years of 2006 and 2008, which were just a couple of years leading up to my entrance into the scene. Essentially this is a list that kicked off what would become an obsession of mine for the next six years of my life. And aside from uh, standard wiring and basics needed to make the project function, these each used a unique method to build and would later become the old style standards for portable building communities. The Darth 64. This was done by Modder Hailraiser. It was a full portable Nintendo 64 back in 2008, and it used a process which we uh, called uh, franking casing. And as I said, this was my, definitely my inspiration. So being the first portable based off a TV game console I'd ever seen, just the very concept was captivating. But not only was it a fully functional portable by de definition, it pioneered concepts that for the next several years would become standard in portable making. And though I don't recall who originally came up with the term, the process known as franken casing was used here flawlessly. Well, the name itself is derived from the classic story Frankenstein, which if you don't know, the mad doctor took body parts from dead people and built a body connected to a synthetic brain to create life. Same idea here. In this case, the process of taking the body of some other electronics enclosure, like a uh, laser doodle or a Game Boy Advance carrying case as examples, and taking subsequent bodies of other component enclosures like controllers or screen bezels, chopping them up, fitting them into place and adhering, filling, sanding, painting until it all looked like one uniform piece. At the time, this had become a very practical option that allowed for pretty much factory functionality of the components, but it also became an art form to pull off correctly due to the hours and hours of casework that was needed. And as far as the electronics go, it was a solid setup for the time and pretty clean for having to work around existing enclosures. But it also utilized what became a driving force in the price gouging on eBay for an original PS1 screens. 
Now, the PS1 screen wasn't much more than a 5-inch composite display made up for the PS1, which was the remodeled and smaller version of the original PlayStation. But it was a very common choice for portableizing because it was already a screen designed for a portable gaming system and was one of the few, if really not the only one, a uh, five-inch panel screen to offer built-in amplifier and speakers. Uh, for several years, these screens got bought up and used in countless portables until uh, vehicle backup screens and eventually factory direct display and driver boards were available on eBay for much cheaper. All right, so the 60 Free Lighter. This was done by Modder Sifuf, if I said that right. Uh, it was a handheld Nintendo 64 back in 2008, and it utilized a form called vacuum forming and also PCB trimming. So Sifuf really raised the bar for console modding when this project was released. It utilized techniques that at the time had only been done successfully in a handful of instances and would have been challenging for those even with a background in electronics. While well, Hailraiser's DOS 64 Portable did what was called a cart slot relocation, which basically just moves the game cart to where it's inserted, or to a different place, that was about the extent of the motherboard modification. His case had, pretty, had plenty of room and there wasn't much need to do any trimming. But the 63 LiDAR threw caution to the wind and not only trimmed the N64 motherboard, but freaking chopped it down to the smallest anyone had seen at the time. But not only that, he also chopped the PS1 screen's motherboard, which I don't think had ever been done at that point. But the hits just kept coming, as he also did what we refer to as an expansion pack relocation, which again was certainly one of the more challenging mods to do on the N64. The other impressive component was his vacuum formed enclosure. Vacuum forming had been around for many years at this point, but mostly in prop studios or professional model maker environments. Again, as a DIY standard, uh, as DIY started to come back, low-cost at-home methods of vacuum forming started circulating YouTube, and its place in portable making was quickly realized. It allowed for additional layer design and freedom, and strangely enough, vacuum forming an external enclosure was the first step towards the shift of the build style of what I like to call inside out, which we'll get to a little later. He also pioneered a neat C-stick option that replaced the analog button presses for the C buttons with the control stick. And although it functioned, many found that it was, wasn't quite as practical and kept the same feel as the original system. But as though this was still a cool mod all around, the one thing that kept it from actually being classified as a portable system was that the fact it did not have internal batteries or permanently external mounted batteries and therefore was not self-powered. But it really didn't matter. It was viewed by millions and inspired many who went on to inspire others. So this makes this project a very important part of portableizing history. All right, so the SNESP number three, modder from uh, Brian Henderson, a full portable Super Nintendo back in 2008. And what was unique about this one was the blank pre-made enclosures he used. Now, um, this was still another fine example of franking casing, but what stood out here was the use of a pre-made injection molded shell from a company called Polycase. And between the years of 2007 and 2013, the ZN, AG, and TB series of the enclosures were very popular options for those who wanted, to, uh, wanted a sturdy enclosure that when closing up actually lined up the way it was supposed to. But there were also very easy cases to work with when it came to cutting, drilling, sanding, priming, and painting, which yielded some of the best portable consoles we had seen up to that point. And his electronics work was also clean and pretty standard for the time, and though he did not have to do any trimming for the SNES motherboard, which was just, just the uh, junior model like I have in my portable upstairs, he still did trim the PS1 screen a bit. It wasn't as involved as Sifos trim, and the SNES is a far less complicated system to wire up, but his enclosure work was, and how clean the end result was, was really noteworthy of my list of inspirations. Now, this was the big one. So the L64, though the Darth 64 was my inspiration, the L64 was the inspiration for the Darth 64. So this in its own right makes it worthy of the list, but the whole portable execution was just absolutely amazing, I mean, even by today's standards. And from my understanding, Hailraiser actually bought this or was loaned the L64 itself, and he was, and used it as a guide for his N64. The mad genius behind this design was none other than Marshall H., known for his Ultra HDMI and his 64 drive, and as I actually found out yesterday, the uh, analog pocket in him and his company. So yeah, this, this guy knows his stuff. 
But where it really shined was uh, how clean this came out for being one of the first portable systems to use vacuum forming. And on top of this, he didn't use Franken casing as a technique, which meant the entire layout was penciled in, drilled, and filed down to hand, by hand to perfection. I mean, this kind of case work is an art form in itself, and though the electronics on the inside were basic, with what he had to work with at the time is still an amazing feat. So there were many, many other portables that were made in the time frame after this, but these four projects taught me the basics and really were my inspiration that took me down the rabbit hole. As others started to jump down as well, more specific and in-depth discussions really needed a place to happen. The Ben Heck forums, the first of its kind when it involved making home consoles portable. It had a lot of groundbreaking projects all over the place and really had a cult following that made tech blogs very eager to see what other kinds of hacks and builds came from him and his uh, forum followers. And the Mod Retro forums, they were the second resource that was based around console modding and portabilizing that I found. And though I'm reluctant to say it was a branch off of Ben Heck, it essentially was. Regardless, though, it was another hub for new and experienced console modders to showcase and hone their craft. And then there were the Made by Bacteria forums. So again, reluctant to say, branch off of Ben Heck and MR, but MBB forums would have a much greater impact to me specifically as it was the first site I was ever a moderator on and the ability to influence how the site was actually managed. But there were a great many differences between how these sites would run and who was at the helm of each of it, and it certainly led to its fair share of problems, when, which we might discuss a bit later. But at its core, it had some very quality guides and discussions. And then we get to the BitBuilt forums. So this is the recent and truly last standing as far as updated portable specific content goes. But not only that, they've managed to continue to create gaming content, uh, game changing content for the community and has taken this hobby to the next level. And this has far surpassed the notion of just making a hack in lieu of making a build, which uh, lately have been inspiring the hell out of the world. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, my first projects when I got into it. And so everyone that's gotten into this has had a uh, beginning. And it's to be expected that the first project may look or function a little lackluster due to what's called the learning curve. Especially with a hobby like this at the time when I started, you were on your own for a lot of it. You pretty much got guidelines or this is how I did it type advice and you fast found out that asking for a step-by-step -step guide more than once earned you a quick ban hammer. Uh, so you took what was available, squeezed whatever kind of guidance you could and just plowed through it to get something that was actually working. And that mentality behind my first prod portable project. I just wanted it to function and prove to myself that this was a concept that was doable for me. AKA, I set my expectations. The Virgin 64 was a uh, stepping stone on so many different skill sets that I had to start to tune over the years that if I just, if I hadn't done things the way I did, I'd be on a totally different path right now. I mean, being as green as I was, knowing next to nothing about electronics or even how to solder kind of stacked my odds from the start. But to make it even more complex, I wanted to use vacuum forming for my own design. I knew nothing about that either. The one thing I did know and have going for me was that I had quite a bit of experience with work, woodworking and general carpentry. That laid a good base for designing not only the wooden molds for the enclosures, but also to build the vacuum forming machines themselves. Still though, it wasn't exact science by any means, and my first attempts at an enclosure design were uh, pretty terrifying. But this became the base of everything that I've built since, and which is good because it means it's buried under concrete and I'll never have to see it again. But if it wasn't there, like any building, the strongest part is probably ugly, buried out of sight, but it carries absolutely everything else. So as the years passed, every new project took these lessons from the previous and built upon them, as well as adding new layers to the foundation through new techniques like CNC milling and eventually into CAD 3D modeling and 3D printing. But there was some problems. The hobby stagnates. Between the years of uh, 2008 and 2013 is what I really believe to be the first golden age of portable making where new portables of every kind were showing up all over tech blogs and techniques to build them began to get more advanced as the blog, build logs and how-to guides increased. But by 2013, the scene was getting pretty tired. The novelty had worn off and the general public's view and the little thing called the Raspberry Pi had started its own portable console scene based on hardware emulation. 
Given that this was newer, it had a great deal of versatility across multiple platforms. Original hardware-based mods were suddenly on pretty shaky ground. And things wouldn't get much better uh, for the next few years either. Uh, such to the point that by 2015, even longtime modders were moving on to other ventures or even closing up shop for good. Some here may remember the day that the mod uh, made by Bacteria Forms closed its doors with next to no warning and the resounding middle finger to the community that that implied. But it was a very personal hit to me because even though I was no longer a moderator, the amount of time I spent creating, moderating content to make it one of the cleanest and friendliest sites for people to learn about the hobby had just evaporated. And uh, Ben Heck and Mod Retro had also kind of bottomed out at the time. But it really just dumbfounded me that so little thought and all the members that did help bring that site to what it was to, at its peak could easily just be brushed aside. Hundreds of people made work logs on the site, made reference material, shared techniques, and made project showcases, all for their work to be wiped out with not so much as a chance to back up a copy for themselves. And it left a pretty bitter taste in a lot of people's mouths. And then with the Ben Heck forums close to new members and Mod Retro pretty much done, uh, Raspberry, and with the power of the Raspberry Pi growing, um, traditional portables were looking like they were on their way out. But tech saves the portable. But before everything started to go in hell in a handbasket for the modern community, in 2012 I found myself laid off from my primary job and decided I wanted to give things a go on my own. To do this, however, was going to require getting into fields I'd never done and were really just starting to get into the affordable range for the regular Joe. And this, of course, was 3D modeling and 3D printing and circuit board design. And thus opened up a new rabbit hole that brought not only bigger and more exciting opportunities to me, but the community as a whole. And these would soon become the catalyst to the resurgence of the hobby for the next generation. But again, that didn't come easily because even though I'd had nearly three years of portable making experience when I started down this path, when I started down this path of 3D modeling, there again was nothing documented about how to specifically apply that to a portable game console because it really had only been done a handful of times at that point. Then getting over the learning curve of 3D modeling to begin with, which was a mega leap for me, but after a couple of weeks of diving into SOLIDWORKS, the basics were then put in place and it didn't take very long after to realize the enormous potential and that this practice could bring. But even I couldn't have imagined that I would become, or what it would become, and not only define a new build process, but essentially take it over. So now before 3D modeling and printing was a thing, um, in regards to portable making, it all revolved around the build process that really required you to work from the outside in. And by this, you were very much limited to utilizing what was already existing components and mostly repurposing them for your particular project. Now, this at heart is what the term modding is all about, but this also meant that if you bought a controller off eBay and wanted to use your ZN45 enclosure, you had to make that controller fit in not only the constraints of the enclosure, but also everything else that was going to be around it. And most of the time, you had no idea what the hell that was going to be until you started putting it together. It honestly was a nightmare of a process sometimes because you could literally be to the point where everything was working perfectly. You go to close it up and bump. Bump, bump. And you're just like, what the? The case won't close. And you're like, what the hell's going on? So then you are just there holding it like a pair of binoculars and trying to see through the wires and everything and trying to see what what is holding things up and you realize that your control stick is actually right on top of your batteries with no place to put, no other place to put either of them. So, I mean, you get right to the very end, literally the culmination of sometimes a month's worth of work getting denied right before the final screwing. And uh, that kind of frustration could be enough to make people want to give up, but, and I've been there more times than I can count, and I believe that if techniques would have stayed that way, I possibly would have given up as well. But uh, my first major dive into 3D modeling printing was back in 2012 when I was working on a project called the Crossplane. It was a concept that was way ahead of anything I had done ever up to that point, and, was going to re and what was going required to pull it off needed a lot tighter tolerances than vacuum forming and even CNC machining could provide. But I was only scratching the surface on how advanced things were going to get in the coming years, and more than once, cost prohibitive technologies became more affordable to everyone. And while 3D printing brought new flexibility to console modding, being able to design all your components, including electronic ones, was a bit of a stretch. 
Digging into the actual electronics of the controllers and motherboards had always been daunting, even if you, uh, and even if you did, for the longest time you still had to work around their layouts and maybe be able to trim them down a bit further. But don't get me wrong, I mean board trimming is still one of the core skills of a console modder and for more, and even more so when specifically talking about portables. But like the intro to 3D printing, PCB manufacturing at low volume was about to solidify the inside, the inside out method for good. So for those of you who don't know, low volume circuit board manufacturing has actually been around since late 2009, but really started to take off in the mid 20 teens. And really all this was was a way to leverage the cost of one off prototypes to those of a mass produced unit. Now we have to keep in mind that traditional industry at the time was still behind the eight ball as far as production methods were concerned. And prototype boards still incurred the setup costs and machine time to run the same ones that large production jobs would have, only they were spread out over sometimes millions of boards. It wasn't until someone realized that the internet is huge and there are a lot of people slash designers who, love to use, who would love to use true PCBs in their production and prototypes. So when Osh Park came around and found the ability to give you $5 pricing per square inch for three full boards, yeah, that opened up a lot of doors. And the same for 3D printing, learning how to make 3D models in CAD software became the same for those wanting to learn how to make PCBs through tracing software. So programs like Eagle, KiCad, and DipTrace became very popular options for at-home circuit board design. So with all that said, it's really not much of a surprise to see why 3D printing and custom PCBs and portableizing go so well together. And the ability to accommodate fit, form, and function of a product from the basement or a bedroom is really just insane because traditionally this could have only been done with big corporate money or big shops with lots of expensive gear. But again, not, after, not long after diving into 3D modeling and printing, I began to realize what kind of potential these tools would bring, and I think the biggest shift is not just console modding, but the maker movement as a whole at this point. And, the ability was, and that ability was able to design a project from the inside out. And I know I keep saying that, but you literally could take your components, mock up dimensionally accurate 3D models of them, fit everything in place, and then design an enclosure around them, and which became an entirely new build process and again, one that I've dubbed as the inside out process. It's gotten to the point now where just about anyone has access to some kind of custom component that's designed to take a majority of the guesswork out of the process in some form or another. Uh, you could get an STL file for 3D printed parts or files off of GitHub for custom code or even fully 3D printed PCBs for audio and power management ready to buy. Uh, hell, a couple years ago, there was even a DIY kit release for the, N6, uh, for the Nintendo Wii that really just shown how far things have progressed in the past few years alone. But there are some uh, roadblocks for this coming in the future, uh, mainly because modern systems are more computers now than console based. They're very complex, they're very large and power hungry. Pretty much everything a portable tries not to be. And as long as we're on the subject of the Wii, when it first arrived in late 2006 in the US, it was a system that solidified Nintendo's path away from traditional consoles to what we see now in most gaming hardware. Technically, this was their second CD-based system. The GameCube had made this before, blah, 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 but then they switched to the full-size CDs. But this was done mainly because games were becoming so complex that anything cart-based didn't stand a chance due to their limited storage, and in comparison to CDs, were far more expensive to produce anyway. So as CD-ROMs became the norm, the hardware had to evolve. The Xbox and Playstations were already far ahead in that regard, having used CDs since day one. But the Nintendo jumping on board, this meant that at the time, all portables after the Nintendo 64 were going to have to be CD-based, which would take a lot more juice and would be a lot more complex to work with. And again, the power consumption and the complexity in the power consumption would only get greater which after PlayStation 2, there really was no hope of making the later generations of PlayStation portable, except maybe aside from a massive laptop and the Xbox never stood a chance as that thing was a tank to begin with. And though Nintendo's hardware after the Wii could technically have been modded, there really was no point uh, because they started down a whole new path of making their hardware portable to begin with. Though the Wii U failed, the Switch did not. And so this brings us to a, a fairly harsh reality here. And that's that the Wii may be the last. It, you know, and the painstaking thought is difficult to avoid. You know, as the graphics and storage requirements are only going to increase and systems become inherently portable anyway, it seems that this could be a perfect example of an evolutionary dead end. 
Not to say that the will be the end of console modding or portableizing, but it's very possible the scope has been reached. But even with that said, there are still groups out there that have pushed the limits with the Wii further than I thought was ever possible, so as far as to make a Wii system fit in a damn Altoids tin. So again, not to say somebody won't reverse a PS3 motherboard in some new, and some new nano battery that takes up a quarter of the space with twice the power won't come around, but there comes a point that the complexity is just going to be too much to be worth it, or more so to the point that original hardware couldn't be used to do it, which brings us to our last couple of issues. So emulators and the Raspberry Pi can now put up a, a pretty substantial fight against the older um, original hardware. And though I know it'll get some head shaking at me when I say that, the truth is that it, there is truth to it to a certain point. And while I agree that hardware is the best for our uh, compatibility and playability, emulators have been making steady improvements on platforms like the Raspberry Pi and others. And though they've really had trouble cracking fluid game play on systems above the N64, Pis are only going to get more powerful and will really only be a matter of time before they're on par with hardware from 20 years ago. And then there's the ethics debate, and this one's kind of painful to say, and, but some make a case against any kind of console modding that or uses original hardware under the claim that manufacturers stopped producing these systems, there became a finite amount of them left in the world, and eventually will go away if people keep modding them. And while, they're, while I agree with that statement to an extent, um, I believe that kind of claim is made by those who have only seen an end result and never actually participated in the process of creating a portable. Because uh, if they had, they would have found out real quick that when we source a console to mod, we're not looking for the new in-box or collector's edition systems. Hell, we're not even looking for the old attic or basement find. What, we're, what we want are the broken for parts only deals for systems and controllers that their next step was the trash bin anyway. And where at that point, they're gone forever. Um, and we give these trash bound systems another chance at life and regrettably, older consoles are getting trash faster than they are being made into portable or other custom mods. So realistically, it's just time that's going to make these consoles disappear like anything else. Regardless of the method and attempts to preserve, there will eventually only be a few in a, in a display case that some rich guy who loves retro tech will have. However, the games that were once played on those systems will have transcended like any others and will be playable on some kind of device. And, you know, being able to play them, I guess, is what it's really all about. But, um, yeah, so I think I've kind of uh, come to the conclusion here that I should probably stop doing this. Um, I do appreciate you listening and, you know, you guys being here. And, yeah, that's all I got. All right, everybody, give it up for Chris Downing. Chris, great job. I almost said congratulations. But, uh, you did it. All right.